So I'm going to read a little bit from where we left off. We need translation for Russian. Hold on one second. I forgot my stand, so we're making a do some makeshift stand. Yeah, that's good. Good enough. So. Uh, last week we were reading about this story of Maharaj Jayanti. And he got a blessing that if his son or if anyone would give him their youth, he could exchange it. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Yes? So he was asking his various sons about his youth, and I um, was reading something, but I didn't finish it. It was I thought it was quite interesting. We didn't finish the purport. So he had, we had talked about Marjayati had asked his sons will you give me your youth? And they all refused. Which is improper. Because the father is like the guru. So you shouldn't refuse. But Puru, his refusal was glorified. Where the other's refusal was considered whimsical. Whimsical? So I want to read why. So, no, Yadu. Yadu. Not Puru, Yadu. So Yadu is one of the sons, and his refusal is glorified. And I want to read why. Maharaj Yadu was completely aware of the principle of religion. The ultimate principle of religion is to engage in devotional service. But there was an impediment. During youth, the desire to enjoy is very strong. And unless one fully satisfies his desires in youth, his lusty desires, there is a chance of one's being disturbed in rendering service. So then Prabhupada goes on to explain that sometimes a man renounces, becomes a sannyasi, and he can't maintain it because the, desire, the youthful desires are still present. So, Yadu was thinking, when I'm older, I'm going to be the king. And in order to be king, I need to be saintly. And if in youth I give up my youth to my father, those desires won't be satisfied and then I won't be able to renounce when I'm older and that is going to impede my service.
Can you whisper? Is it possible? Can you lower? Possible. Or maybe sit back there? Is this better? Yeah. Um, so what's so interesting about this? His desire to enjoy, in a sense, is not a desire to enjoy. But it's a desire to advance in devotional service. But he knows, he knows that he needs to enjoy to be able to renounce. Isn't that interesting? So then he's looking at the desire to enjoy as part of his devotional service. And, and really, if you understand it, it's not enjoyment for enjoyment's sake, it's enjoyment for renunciation's sake. If I don't have this, I can't renounce it. So I need to enjoy it to be able to renounce it. So I'm actually thinking of renunciation by my enjoyment. Isn't that interesting? So, in other words, when we say material enjoyment, that would mean there's no Krishna involved. But here, Krishna is involved in his enjoyment because he, he sees that he, he's thinking this will ultimately be the best way to be Krishna conscious. Isn't that interesting? Um, so, and so in that sense, you can say it's not really material enjoyment. Now let's flip it around. Let's say I do austerity. Is it possible to do austerity for sense gratification? To, to gain some sense gratification from the austerity? It's possible, right? If you chant 64 rounds every day, and you walk around and make sure everybody sees that, you know, the 64 rounds means, it means these beats here are down. Because for every 16, one comes down. Did you know? 16, 32, 48, 64. So let's say you chant 64 and, and you're walking around the campus, you know, chanting. It's kind of like this. You're chanting and, and everybody can see. Whoa, he's on, he's on, he's, He's got 61 rounds today. He's only got three left. And kind of showing off. Right? I mean, of course, we're making this up. But I'm sure if you've ever done something wonderful, you might have had the thought that it would really be nice if other people knew. Yes? I did some austerity this week. I just drank water. and There would be some gratification if other, if other people knew that's what I did. Yes? So, you can, if that's the case, you've just done austerity for sense gratification. So, here, so here we have two examples. Sense gratification for becoming Krishna conscious. Austerity for becoming puffed up. So austerity or sense gratification within a certain context becomes the opposite. So we have this context here. Um, so now you look at anything you do and you, and you have to ask what's the end of, what's the goal of it? What am I trying to accomplish? Because you can do something which seems to be very Krishna conscious but it doesn't accomplish Krishna consciousness or vice versa. Something that doesn't seem very Krishna conscious and it does accomplish Krishna consciousness. Right? Have you ever heard the saying, you have to take a few steps back to take a few steps forward? Have you ever heard, do you have that saying? It's like you take one step back so you can take two steps forward. Like you, you, you step back and get ready and you move forward. 
So I may be going like this in my spiritual life, but then I realize I can't go any further. I have to do something different. So I step back and figure out what I have to do. Maybe I have to go like this, but at least it's still going up. You understand? I can't go like this anymore. I've hit. I won't, I won't be able to go this way. I have to go this way. So I have to make some adjustment. But when I make the adjustment, my thinking is, if I make this adjustment, it'll help me become Krishna conscious. So the context is what's going to help my Krishna consciousness. Not how austere it is or how austere it isn't. So that's what's, that's what's being taught here. Now, in the Gita, you have austerity in different modes of nature, right? And Narada Muni says, it's this nice verse. If you don't like austerity, this would be your verse. He said, what's the use of austerity if it doesn't make you Krishna conscious? And if you're already Krishna conscious, what's the use of austerity? So that gets you out of austerity. But he's referring to austerity just for the sake of sense control, independent of bhakti. So he says, what's the use of that? Because that austerity won't make you Krishna conscious. And if you already are Krishna conscious, why do you need austerity? So, the point is, we're not after austerity for the sake of austerity. And I can give you a story. You want to hear a story? Yes. About austerity? I'm not saying we don't do austerity, but I'm saying we don't do it for the sake of austerity. So, every morning Prabhupada goes on a morning walk, and so this is in Vrindavan. And one of the devotees is late, and so they run out. And they don't have time to get their shoes, so they just run out. And then they show up without their shoes. And Prabhupada said, where are your shoes? He said, oh, Prabhupada, I was late. No time to get my shoes. And then Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness is already austere enough. You don't have to make it more austere. Like, it's not just for the sake of austerity's sake. You know, like, what's the function of austerity for the sake of austerity? Unless it's going to make you Krishna conscious. Right? So, um, so you have austerity in different modes of nature. Um, and then you have important austerities, like in the Gita, what is the, who knows the austerity of speech? Anybody know what Krishna says? The austerity of speech is what? You should not disturb others yeah. when you speak. You should base your speech on a Vedic philosophy. Uh, it, it, it should be. Um, uh, it will be nice uh, to hear. hear easy, it, yes. easy. Uh, and it should, it should be uh, truthful. Satyam Priya. Mm -hmm. Speak the truth, but speak it pleasingly. So that's an austerity of speech. So then, when we, when we look at austerity, then we want to, want to discover, well, what, what are the austerities that are important? Right? Not just, okay, I'll, uh, maybe I'll do some fasting or something, but I may be giving up more important austerities. So this is a... This is a very important austerity to not be critical of devotees, and and we all know how difficult that is. So this kind of satyam priya, this kind of austerity, is, you know, is something we should focus on. The austerity of rising early—that's something Prabhupada emphasized. The austerity of listening to the maha mantra when we chant. These are very important austerities. The austerity of Sacrificing personal convenience to give Krishna consciousness. These are the kinds of austerities that are directly in relation to Krishna. And, Grihastha life is an austerity. Now some men, most women and some men, need to be married. But it's a sacrifice. A single man loses freedom. He has to provide for a family. The wife has to take care of the children and the home. It's an austerity. I have a godbrother, he's a sannyasi. And he said, he said, Grihastas have nice homes, but it's not sense gratification because there's so much austerity 
in maintaining a family, getting along, raising kids, making money. He said, but if a sannyasi lives in a nice home like that, it's sense gratification, because there's no austerity, because he doesn't have the wife and the family. So, so I thought that was an interesting point. So, so the grihasta doesn't get contaminated by the nice house, because within it is austerity. Whereas the sannyasi, his life is supposed to be austere, and if his living is too comfortable, and there's no austerity, it's not healthy. So he lives, he should live more simply. And then austerity is proportionate to the order of life you're in. So, so Senya's life is all about austerity. That's, that's, and Vanakras is preparing for austerity. And Grihastha life is not so austere. It's got its austerity built into it. It's a different kind of austerity. And Brahmacharya life is austere. So it depends what ashram you're in. And so, um, if you're too austere in Grihastha Ashram, it won't work because then you'll deprive your family of certain comforts and that, that wouldn't make sense, right? It makes sense in Vanakrast when you're renouncing. But you, family, children, they need certain levels of security and comfort. So, but then as I said, your austerity is providing it. So austerity appropriate. That is appropriate to your position. Uh, and then, Prabhupada said the greatest austerity. Who knows what Prabhupada said is the greatest austerity? To go out and preach. To bring people to Krishna. Whatever that is, book distribution, or any kind of preaching, he said that's the greatest austerity because there's so much resistance to do it and, and sometimes we'll be uh, inconvenienced or mistreated. Sometimes we're put in jail. I've, I've been arrested five times. That's a devotee. Not before I was a devotee. After. I never saw a jail cell before I was a devotee. I never knew anybody who was in jail. So, but these are austerities which are, uh, of course, directly in the line of the order of the group. And so we embrace these kinds of austerity. And then, then you know, you probably heard the story that um, one devotee was fasting on the codice and then he, he told Srila Bhakti Siddhanta that I, you know, in fasting I don't have strength to preach, you know, that eat, to go out and preach. That's a greater austerity. You know? So one of the things that I've noticed about Srila Prabhupada, and it's not to say that we can't do it differently, but I noticed that his main focus was on giving Krishna consciousness not on so much austerity, personally, of fasting and, and this, of course, Prabhupada did the austerity of staying home, only sleeping a little bit. But I would say, in general, his focus of austerity was on giving Krishna consciousness, more than any, like, severe renunciation. And he... He did want his sannyasis to be more renounced, and he did want all of us to attend the full morning program and rise early. It, it didn't matter if you were married or not. He had pretty much the same standard. And he um, sometimes called his grihasta sannyasi, so he, he wanted them to live very in, in similar ways. Not all, in all ways, but in similar ways to, to the other orders of life as preachers. Prabhupada defined austerity as accepting bodily inconvenience for the sake of spiritual advancement, not accepting bodily inconvenience for the sake of bodily inconvenience. So, but for the sake of spiritual advancement. So, if I try to execute more austerity than I'm able, I can't maintain it. And austerity, like detachment, it comes naturally as you advance. At the same time, you have to push yourself a little. But if someone tries to push themselves too much, there's a chance that they'll just give up their austerity when they can't maintain it. It's like, I can't do this, why try, and then they give it up. Have you seen that before? 
someone who's very austere and then they just they can't maintain it because it was artificial so it's it's not a great credit to be artificially austere temporarily the sentiment is nice Really, the way Prabhupada taught austerity, in, in many ways, was through sense gratification. Like, like, how much sense gratification do you need? And you accept what you need, that's your, auster that's, that's your austerity, that you only accept what you need. How much do you need to eat? How much do you need to sleep? What ashram do you need to be in? And so forth. What do you need to be inspired in Krishna consciousness? And if you don't take more than you need, that's your austerity. That her need, my need, your need may be different. And so it's important not to compare ourselves. Say, well, he's, he's austere, so I should be as austere as him. You may not be able to do that. And um, what is austere for him may not be austere for you. So you can do more austerity, or less. So Prabhupada's point was, <laughs> there's a story. Prabhupada said, um, you should only eat two chapatis a day, and one, and one cup of dal. Could you imagine eating one, two chapatis and one cup of dal, that's all? Yeah. That's what he said, so that's what we did. Basically, we were starving. But Prabhupada said to do that. So we thought he said, so we did it. We had a little breakfast, small, and then lunch was a cup, not this size cup, about half this size cup, and two chapatis, and that's lunch. And that's it for the day. That's all you get. So, it's a funny story. Because there was a second sentence to that instruction. But we only got the first sentence. And the second sentence was, but if you can eat ten chapatis, if you can digest ten chapatis, then you can take ten chapatis. And we didn't get that second instruction like two or three weeks. So for a few weeks we were starving, basically. And so we were doing austerity. For sure we were doing austerity. And what were we thinking about all day? As you could imagine, thinking about eating because we're hungry. And we all know when you get very hungry, it hits a certain point where you have to eat. Isn't it? Like, you ever get so hungry, like if you don't eat, if anyone's in the room, they, they may be endangered. Like you might just get so agitated, you're just like, Get out of my way, I'm on my way to the refrigerator, if you're in the way. You know, it gets like that. Right? So, it was something like that for us. So, this is of course common sense and obvious. What's the point of doing that austerity if all the result of that austerity is you're thinking about eating all day? Right? So Prabhupada's point was, well how much do you need to eat so you can stop thinking about eating? So his, uh, his definition of austerity is go up to that point where you can stop thinking about it and don't go beyond that point because beyond what you need becomes sense gratification. Right? And up to what you need, that's austerity. Right? Even the prasadam is very good or you, you have to sleep eight hours, whatever it is, but, and you, you know, you're a big man or woman and you can eat ten chapatis and three cups of all, whatever it is, that's it's not, it's all relative to what you need to be able to do your service. And so sense gratification just becomes defined as gratification beyond what's necessary, not gratification in general. Does that make sense? So, you know, Prabhupada didn't talk a lot about austerity, but he talked a lot about sense gratification. If you, if you notice, reading Prabhupada's books, you'll see sense gratification come up a lot. 
Um, and it's, it's more like he spoke about avoid sense gratification than performing austerity, because that is the austerity. Right? And when Prabhupada talked about Sankirtan, it was always make sure the Sankirtan devotees have sumptuous prasada, they get enough to eat. Why? Because they're going out all day to Shivanim books, and that's the real austerity. So, so if you minimize your eating in the name of austerity, and that impedes the real service, then Prabhupada would say, well, that's uh, useless austerity. Right? So the austerity was to go out and distribute the books, and therefore eat what you need and sleep as much as you need so you can go do that austerity. So that's, right? So, okay, maybe I need to sleep more if I'm going on book distribution all day. Okay, so why am I sleeping more? To distribute books. Not because I like to sleep more, right? Have you ever done that? I used to do that. Because I realized when I was tired, it took me like two more hours to distribute the same amount of books. But if I was rested, I could do in four hours what took six hours. Any of you have that experience? So before I would do Sankir time, I used to take rest for an hour, so I wasted one hour. But still, even though I wasted an hour, I could still distribute as many books as I could if I didn't take the rest, actually more. So was that resting sense gratification? Of course not. It was for service. Okay. Dharma Smi. Uh, Kamosmi Bharatashiva, okay, now, the greatest sense gratification in the world. Why do you do that? I mean, in the perfect Krishna conscious world, why do you do that? Only one reason, to have children, that's all. So then it's not sense gratification. But if you do it for any other reason, it's sense gratification. Right, so the austerity is to do it for having children. Not that the austerity is not to not do it, but to do it for having children. And what did Srila Bhakti Siddhanta say? He, said, he was a brahmacharya, nice sticky brahmacharya. He never had any connection with a woman his whole life. And what did he say? He said, um, if by having sex I could produce Krishna conscious children, I'd be prepared to, to have sex a hundred times, or prepared to have a hundred children. So for him, it wasn't sense gratification, because it was for service, okay? Have you ever seen <coughs> Sankirtan devotees eat a lot? I shouldn't ask that question. Who has not seen Sankirtan devotees eat a lot? Okay, so we, we've seen that, and, and it's, they're gonna go out on Sankirtan, and the temple, at least in the temple, the uh, temples that I lived in, during Christmas time, the breakfasts were quite, they were like Sunday feasts. You know, puris and deep fried sabjis with sour cream, and halava and nectar, pakoras, rice, sabji. That was breakfast. And everybody just feasted in the morning. But, the mood was, I'm going to go out all day and distribute books. So it really wasn't sense gratification, it just looked like it. And a lot of times, the biggest distributors are the ones who ate the most prasad. <laughs> Isn't it? Have you seen it? You've seen it? Yeah. So they're thinking, I need to do this in order to do my service. So. As long as everything's connected with Krishna, then, then even eating that big meal is austere. Because like for myself, I'd rather eat a small breakfast. But if I have to go on Sankarnat all day and there's not going to be prasad until the evening, I have to eat a big breakfast. So that eating big breakfast becomes an austerity for me, because I'd rather not. Right? Or I need to eat it because I'm going out in cold weather. I need to stay warm. So it becomes an austerity. So. 
Um, maybe one of the greatest austerities that we have to perform is in the Grihasta Ashram. Because in the Grihasta Ashram, you have all facility for enjoyment. And you're not allowed to enjoy, to enjoy it. Like everything's there, all the paraphernalia. The husband, the wife, the home, the children, the money, the furniture, it's like, it's all set up. And you're supposed to be detached. Right? And that's part of the austerity of your hospital life. That you have everything, but you detach. You don't, you don't, you always keep Krishna consciousness in the center. Does that make sense? So that's an so Grihasta life has, has that as a built-in austerity. Yes? The object of, you live with the object of sense gratification and you can't enjoy it, at least you're not supposed to, or you're supposed to limit the enjoyment. And the very object of sense gratification that you want to enjoy, you're supposed to serve. That means the men also serving the wives, not just the wives serving the men. Isn't that hard? You have the object of sense gratification and you're supposed to serve it instead of enjoy it. Is that difficult? Yes? <laughs> yeah, so that's... And, and you're a sannyasi, what do you have? People giving you money, you have followers, the same thing. You have so, so many objects of sense gratification and you have to renounce it all. You can't enjoy it, you can't think. This is my money, this is my anything. These are my followers, and nothing is mine. So that's the austerity. And, and Prabhupada is, is, is said, that Krishna is, he's really happy when you have something that you enjoy and you give it up. He's really happy. It, it, Krishna feels like you've made a great sacrifice and he appreciates it. That you wanted this and you gave it up. So like, like for some of us, living, we live in Mayapur. It may be different for some of you. Mayapur materially may be better for some of you, but for some of us, it's lower. Um, our place here in Mayapur is, is exactly 50% the size of our place in America. And land-wise, it's about 1 50th of the size of our land. So materially, it's a step down. But spiritually, it's a step up. So we make a sacrifice for what's better spiritually. And so we give up something which may be comfortable or enjoyable, Right? No cars, walk to the store, etc. Whatever austerities you go for. But because it's helpful spiritually, we do it. So Krishna appreciates that. And I can prove this, at least in one incident that's very clear. One of our devotees, who was a grihasta, took sannyas. And Prabhupada was glorifying him. <clears throat> And he was glorifying them, especially, <clears throat> he said, because you had a wife and children, and you gave that up to take sannyas. And he never glorified a brahmachari like that who took sannyas. Because brahmacharis don't have wife and children. So he glorified what that Brihasta had to give up to take sannyas. Isn't that interesting? So that that austerity of giving up something which is enjoyable, which you could enjoy, you have opportunity to enjoy, and you give it up. Krishna is really happy when you do that. And so that is definitely an austerity that we all... that we all perform. Um, there's a story... Vishwanath Chakravarti Chakravarti. He was married, but he, he, he didn't sleep with his wife in the same room. 
The spiritual master said, well, you should sleep with your, you should sleep with your wife. It wasn't his inclination. So that was the order of his guru. So what can he do? So, so he went in bed with his wife and the whole nine, night he stayed up chanting. <laughs> so there's the object of enjoyment sitting next to you. But instead of enjoying it, you're up all night chanting. So that is really, the, for us, the ultimate definition of austerity, to be in the proximity of sense gratification, of the opportunity, but to relinquish it in preference for Krishna's service. And that's what Krishna appreciates so much. So now, I would ask you to think, is there anything in your life which may be detrimental to your bhakti, but favorable to your sense gratification, that you think would be useful to give up? And if there isn't, I'm not saying there is, maybe there isn't, but if there is, and you can give it up, you will please Krishna in a very big way. Could be money. Maybe you're good at making money. Now what will you do with that money? Will you give some up for Krishna's service or will you just build a bigger house? Right? So these are options we're always facing all the time. You go shopping. What are you going to buy? What do you need to buy? Or do you just buy because you want it? Do I really need it? So, yeah, are, we're always confronted with these choices, right? But sometimes it works the opposite way. Sometimes we need to buy nice things for service. Like, um, I didn't bring any dhotis here to Mayapur because I thought I had dhotis, but all my dhotis are completely destroyed. And um, my kurtas are looking pretty bad. And I'm going to Bangalore in a few days. And that's a city and everybody's going to look at me. So I went and I had a, I just ordered some dhotis and kurtas and they're going to make them. You know? So that's an austerity for me because I prefer to dress simply. But Prabhupada said the Bengali proverb is you have to dress to please others. So you know, it's up to me, I would just wear a t-shirt and some yogi pants and I would be happy. But I can't. There'll be, you know, 500 people to Sunday feast and whatever. And, and I've gone there before and I've dressed nicely and so many people said, I really like the way you dress. So now I can't disappoint them. <laughs> so that's another kind of austerity where you have to do something nice and you'd prefer not to. It's kind of like a reverse austerity. You have to sometimes accept things that maybe pamper you a little bit or, or, or like, like for example, uh, Prabhupada, when he was living in his kutir, they finally finished the building here, and then they said to Prabhupada, your rooms are ready here and you can move in. And he said, I don't want to move in. He said, because that building is in the mode of passion, and my hut is in the mode of goodness, and I like my hut. He said, but Prabhupada, it's more prestigious for you, when people will appreciate you more as the guru of the Hare Krishna movement, it doesn't look right that the guru of the Hare Krishna movement lives in a little hut. This is a nice building, at least by standards of 1974, that was a pretty nice building for at least around here. Then Prabhupada agreed, okay, I will move into your Rajasik building, because it was for preaching. So he accepted that, you know, so sometimes it's like, sometimes I will meet important people and someone will tell them, oh, here's Mahatma Prabhu, he's this and that, and they're like, they're building me up. So I, I have to actually have a place to stay and be dressed and carry myself in a way that equates with what these people expect, otherwise they won't want to listen. And it's not my nature to do that. So sometimes we accept that austerity of having to accept more than we would prefer to accept. Does that make sense? This is another kind of austerity. It's not, 
you're renouncing something that you want to renounce. You're renouncing renunciation. You understand? You're, so, and sometimes that kind of austerity is harder. It's harder to renounce what you like to renounce sometimes. So you can also think in your life, is there anything you're renouncing that you shouldn't renounce? I don't know if there is, but I'm just throwing that question out to you. Is there something that would be beneficial for your service that you don't like, that you prefer to renounce, that wouldn't be good to renounce, that you should accept? So the principle of surrender is accept what's favorable. So is there something favorable you would prefer to renounce? but you should accept it. So that's a kind of austerity. Right? Um, many, many people, although we all want to be honored, but many people feel uncomfortable when they're being honored. It's just, you know, or many people feel uncomfortable being a public figure, being in front of an audience, or being on Facebook, and then, once this is recorded on Facebook, then it goes out, and who knows how many people will see it. Then you become public figure. And so some people, by nature, are very private. They don't like to do that. And then your guru says, I want you to become famous. And that becomes your austerity. And now you have to be in front of people. And you have to accept honor. Maybe you have to live in the palace of the king and you'd rather live in the little hut. So you accept that as your austerity. So austerity has better. Does that make sense? Yes? Now, I'll give you an example. We have maybe a hundred people who are initiating, and not all of them are Prabhupada disciples. I think four of them are not Prabhupada disciples. So let's say we have um, 4,800 initiated devotees. So, well, they haven't approved women yet, so let's say Maybe 3,000 men and only 100, because it's very uncomfortable to, to be honored like that. It's an austerity. And, and a lot of devotees find it difficult to be in that position. And, and those, those who are in that position will say, yes, it's austere to be in that position. I accept that position, but if I could just be a nobody and have a private life, my life would be easier than be a somebody and have no private life. Right? So you know, I think, oh look at so-and-so, he's so famous, it must be nice for him to be famous. And he may be a very private person, very introverted, and he would prefer like nobody knew him. And he does that as an austerity, and then he uses that reputation um, to preach to people, because people respect him and people will listen to him. And so he'll accept that because it's favorable for bhakti. So, all right. People know me, oh, I, I can get an engagement preaching in such and such a prestigious place because I have some reputation, okay, I'll do it. But otherwise, for myself, it's very uncomfortable. And it's, so that becomes a, an austerity, right? So that's something for you to think. Is there something that you could be doing that you're not doing? Because it would make you feel uncomfortable? And, and consider, maybe I should do that. Maybe I should take the austerity. Maybe you shouldn't. I can't say you should or shouldn't. That's for you to decide, but it's something to contemplate. Is there something I could do I'm not doing because I would be uncomfortable? But it's favorable for devotional service. Yes? So you can meditate on that. So... You want to ask questions? I don't know if anyone here has asked a question. Yes. Uh, I'm thinking about this. You said uh, also in the earlier lecture about uh, if you only take, for example, Lalu, if you only eat one Lalu a month, yeah. for some people it's fine, but for other people they meditate on that Lalu the whole yes. month. So is it better maybe eating one Lalu every day? Then you don't yeah. have to eat that. Yes. So I think especially with children. Yes. So 
So, and the usage of like iPad, for example. Mm -hmm. So with her, I have a rule, it's like only on Saturdays. Yeah. But then the whole week rolled on, can I watch, can I watch, can I watch, can I watch, can I watch. So I'm thinking, is that, you know, like that one, <laughs> Lalu, is that better? Or you can have, you know, like 15 minutes every day, you know, and then you don't have that. Maybe, I, w I was thinking, one day we'll have a fire sacrifice. And everyone will bring their phone and iPad and <laughs> throw it in and say, we're renouncing this culture, this civilization. Do you want to talk to me? Write a letter or fly to my airport? Um, you know, it's an interesting question because it's like you've already taken a left turn and gone the wrong way. And then it's like, well, do I go right or left now? Well, it doesn't matter because... Right or left, they're both wrong, you know, so what's less wrong? And I think you've answered the question, it's kind of like, you know the saying, don't live, don't die? Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Either way is not good, but um, probably what you're doing is fine. And, uh, <coughs> you know, I have to read this, as a body sent me something. He said it's a brilliant short book about how, how our um, devices have completely distracted us and they're destroying us. It's not, it's not about devotees, it's just about people in general. Um, we, we don't have, um, we, we've lost the ability to be able to focus on what's important because we have these devices that distract us. So, um, I think also, you know, if you're teaching children or you're teaching anybody, you have to teach the principle behind it. See? Because if you, you know, if you don't do this, then when you're adult, this will become addiction. You know, you won't be able to go anywhere without it. You'll always have to be looking at it every ten minutes. I re maybe somebody knows. I can't remember, but I read how many times people look at their phones a day, and it came out to be like every six minutes or something. You know, it's just like so sad. So it, it's in planting those so those seeds. So you know, at least if you explain it to her, maybe that'll help. It's and, and in studies that I've seen, the likes have the same dopamine effect or some hormonal effect as drugs. So it's a kind of you know intoxication, or every message you get is an intoxication. And, and when they study the brain, it says they say it's the same effect having on the brain as any kind of addictive behavior. And that's really scary, isn't it? So that's another austerity. At least have your phone off when you chant. I don't bring my phone to the temple anymore. That's also an easy solution, not to be distracted. Just. But in my Java workshops, I always you know, try to emphasize when you chant, you know, you know, you don't, you want to be disconnected, not just from your phone, but from everything. What's well, speaking to your phone? Everything. And I think, um, I'm glad you brought it up, because that's, for some people, that's a big austerity, right? To turn their phone on, to not carry their phone. So, in an article I read, they said two things. They said, if the first thing you do in the morning is go on your phone, that's a sign you're addicted. Another sign is if you're walking around your house and you always have your phone in your hand, that's a sign you're addicted. Like, actually addicted to it. Like, if we take it away, you'll experience withdrawal. And they did an experiment, and they asked, I think people under 25 or 22, to abstain from social media, which meant computers and iPads and phones, for 24 hours. And the people in Argentina, on the average, broke down after 16 hours. They actually couldn't do it. Other countries, India, Indians were able to do it. But some countries couldn't do it. So for us, one of the biggest austerities is to find that thing that's an impediment to our bhakti and then give it up. Because that's one of the principles of surrender. Give up what doesn't help and accept what does help. So those are both austerities. I don't want to do this, it helps. I do it. I like doing this. It's in getting in the way of my bhakti, I have to stop. So that's something you can think about. 
what is it, if anything, that I'm doing that I really shouldn't be doing that's an impediment to my bhakti? That's your austerity. Right? Maybe it's just YouTube. I don't know. Maybe it's Facebook. Maybe it's, I don't know what it may be, but think about what's an impediment and that's your austerity. That's a valuable austerity to perform, to give that up. Yes? If I can't lie and also cover it so that actually you don't see that it's, you know, a hindrance for your, for, your that, for example, if you're working, your work is from your computer or something, and then you, the whole day actually you're just even scrolling or something, you know, like there, maybe you don't even know that it's something that's helping you from developing more bhakti. That may be true, but You could also say, you do know, but you don't want to acknowledge it. Well, I think that might be more the case. You're faking ignorance so you can continue doing it. <laughs> or if you don't know, then I would say you should know. You, you should evolve so that you do know what is an impediment. Because that's the first two principles of surrender, except what's favorable reject what's unfavorable. If I don't even know what's unfavorable, how can I reject it? So I should know what's unfavorable. Right? I should be aware. But it is true that um, sometimes we don't want to admit something's unfavorable because we like it and we don't want to give it up. And so we might have a moment of like, it's okay, it's not so bad, it doesn't bother me, whatever. And that way I don't have to deal with it. But if it, is, if it is actually bad, we should be detached and brave enough to admit that it's bad. And that's the austerity. Sometimes the austerity is just to admit that I shouldn't be doing something. To acknowledge it's not so great. And that can be anything. How I treat other people, how I treat myself. Any variety of activities. Right? Yes? I just want to know where this quote's from. Um, what's the use of austerity if it doesn't keep you from It's from Narada Muni. Who knows that verse? Kim, Kim, Kim Tapasya. What's the use of austerity? Kim. I have to dust my brain out to remember. Maybe from the Narada Pancharaja. If I could come up with a few words, you could look it up. Uh, no? I think you know it's the verse? from a first cantor. First cantor, uh, you know this uh, verse, uh, like, Yathadar Muni Shakyanina, Tritiani Tatkana Satopa Shaka, I think it's from this chapter. Because he says something like this in this chapter. Narada. Give me a second. Maybe we can find it. It's a fun, it's kind of a funny verse. In, it's kind of a funny verse in a sense. Ha! Give me a big hand. I remember it. Say a righty toe, yeah. Huh. Hold on. It came up, but it's not telling us where it is. Aradito yadi haris tapasata darkim. What's the use of austerity if you're pleasing Krishna? The second half of the verse, naradito yadi haris tapasata darkim. And austerity without pleasing Krishna is also useless. So, ah, Narada Pancharatna. Give me another hand. I got it right. Not Bhagavatam, Narada Pancharatra. Aradito yari haris tapasata dakim. Naradito yari haris tapasata. It's an easy verse to remember. It's almost the same. It starts, Aradito yari haris tapasata um, yari haris tapasata dakim. And the next line, Naradito. Just an N and it's the same thing. What's the use if it doesn't please Krishna? 
You don't, you don't need to do austerity if you're Krishna conscious. And if you're not Krishna conscious, you don't need to do austerity because it's not your Krishna. <laughs> so, that's your verse to get out of austerity. Narada Pancharatna 126. Naradito yari haris tapasatadaki. Naradito yari haris tapasatadaki. Ki means what? Tapasya is tapasya. Yadi if. If Hari is not pleased, what's the use? One, two, six. Narada Pancharatra. My brain still works. After all these years, after all that halibut, it still works. You have no idea how much halibut we used to eat on Sundays. It's embarrassing. Well, this is a good. This is a good point because we had very austere diets as brahmacharis for whatever reason. We thought it was the thing to do, or we were told to do, whatever the reason is. So when Sunday came, it was crazy how much we ate. I mean, just like, if you saw how much we ate, I mean, seriously, you'd think we were going to have a heart attack. Like, we would be in the hospital. You can't eat that much and live. So that's the result of too much artificial austerity, that you'll swing to the other side, you know. You'll swing to the other side to make up for all the sense gratification you missed during the week, you make it up on Sunday, as opposed to being regulated a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And we were really good at that. Like making, we were very good at making up for it. And we thought the Sunday feast, you, you just go for it. And during the week you do austerity, but we weren't really advanced enough to do that level of austerity. So we really overindulged on Sunday. And yeah, it was, it was, it wasn't, it was no longer honoring prasadam, it was just sense gratification of all these young 20 year old men who were restricted, who have given up drugs and sex and rock and roll. Only thing they have left is their tongue. <laughs> and that's being restricted all week and that's how it ended up on Sunday. Does that make sense? You have that experience? You've seen that? It's like all your tapasya is ruined on Sunday. All the austerity you did, it's like you lose the value of it. So, yes. Yes. It's not a danger if, if you every day is just uh, using a uh, quarter an hour for watching something, then you are spending some bigger amount and bigger amount per day. What's, what's the question? If you, what? You're engaging in something that's not Krishna conscious for an hour? Like about this. <laughs> like, oh, is it okay? And is it dangerous? Well, well, this is a good point, because it's right there in the Gita, the Prabhupada's talking about regulated sense gratification. And then he makes a very important point, and he says, on the Royal Road, Royal Road is the British, a British name for a highway, you know, like a, a, whatever you call in your country, motorway, highway, we call it a freeway. He said, they're, even on the royal road, they're accidents. So, if you're regulating sense gratification, that's good, but it's still sense gratification, which means there's a chance it won't be regulated, because it's enjoyable, as opposed to just giving it up. If it's something you can give up, it may be safer than regulating. So, at least that's something to be aware of. Okay, sex, once a month after 50 rounds for having kids. That's not so easy, right? So that's the royal road. But there's a danger it could expand into more than that. Then there's frivolous sports. 
Do you, do you know, I don't know if you're all aware of this, but Prabhupada's definition of no gambling is also frivolous sports. It's just, just activities that are a waste of time, like playing cards or checkers or something that has, I mean, you might play some sport because it's healthy, but frivolous means doing something that wastes time. So, you know, we, we can't expect the whole world and every devotee to be that renowned, <coughs> not frivolous, and not watch this and that. But at least we have to understand, it, the way attached, this is Pantanjali, Pantanjali said, the way attachment develops is you do something enjoyable, and it creates an impression in your mind that it was enjoyable, and then it makes you want to do it again. And so that's how addiction happens. So if you want to become renounced from something that's enjoyable, you have to minimize it so it doesn't become an addictive behavior and gradually renounce it. Whereas if you're doing it and it's pleasurable, naturally attachment develops. So that's the tricky part. Now it's great if it's Krishna consciousness, something you like to do in Krishna consciousness. But if it's something else you like to do, you have to be careful. Because it, it can become an addiction. Right? I'm not making judgments and I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying this is how the mind works. That if you think about anything you're attached to, why are you attached to it? Because you've had a pleasurable experience with it. And why are you detached from something? Well, if you're naturally detached and it's not due to your spiritual advancement, it's most likely because you have an unpleasurable or a disgusting or a miserable experience with it, right? Like you'll see some men, Prabhu, you're going to get married. Oh, no, never. I go, why? Oh, I had this girlfriend, she drove me crazy. Uh, you know, it's like... That's where it comes from. If they just think about the opposite sex, it's like it was so bad. They suffered so much. It creates this detachment. Right? So that's what Pantanjali's description of how attachment or detachment develops. It develops either through pleasure, remembrance of pleasurable, past pleasurable experience, or past, past miserable experience. So... If you like to do something and you want to become detached, obviously you have to regulate it and you have to be aware that because I like to do it, it, it can create an addictive, an addiction because whenever I think about it, I want to do it. Right? We all have that experience, right? Isn't it? So, if you've ever been an alcoholic, I don't know if you have, but if you have been, then you know that when you give up alcohol, you're, not that I know this because I've been an alcoholic, but I've studied this, that to break the habit for the rest of your life, they will tell you, don't ever even take one drop. Because <clears throat> the drop will remind you of whatever that pleasure was that you got from it, and it's going to make you, it's going to revive the attachment for it. Yes? Okay, so now the next question is, but what if I'm attached to whatever it is? Well, if you're attached to whatever it is, then you're going to have to figure out how you can connect that to Krishna. Otherwise, that attachment is going to be destroyed. So we're all attached to so many things. I have a friend, a very close friend. He has 18 guitars. That's not including bass guitars. It's just acoustic and electric guitars. He has 18. And maybe three amplifiers, complete recording studio. It's like it's very important for him. And you know he'll go out and do kirtan and play guitar like that. So he has to, he has to do that. He has to do it in a way that he can employ it, employ it in some way in Krishna's service. 
So then, you know, there's two ways of looking at something. You might look at something and think, well, maybe it's not so healthy for me, but I can't give it up. So then how do I employ it in Christian service? So obviously there's some things you can employ and, you know, how do I employ marijuana in Christian service? Well, that's easy. You don't use it. That's how you employ it. And you preach to all the people that smoke marijuana because they'll probably be quite submissive if they're really high. And, you know, they'll buy a bag of the you understand, you, there's certain things you can't employ. I mean, maybe you can preach to people who smoke pot because you used to do it and you know how they think. But there's certain things you can employ in Krishna consciousness. So the things you can employ, what can you do? You have to renounce it. And the things you can't renounce, that you can't employ, then you have to employ them because you can't renounce them. So whatever that is. Right? Oh, I have a nice story. There was a girl who came here maybe two years ago and then she uh, wanted to become my disciple so we stayed in touch and she, was, she didn't know what she wanted to do, Varna, Ashram, she was always up and down. You, you, know those, you know those situations where you're like not in the right Varna, you're not in the right Ashram and you're very unsteady and so your mind's always, it's not stable, you're always, should I do this, should I, should I go here, should I go there? Should I marry this one or that one? Maybe I should not marry. You know, one of those maybe, you know, unstable ways. But she's an artist. So Sidman, she was not sure what she wanted to do. And now she's in a situation where she's got a lot of time to do her art. She's living on a farm in Brazil, so she doesn't have to work. And they're giving her time to do her art. So she sent me a picture of her. And I'd never seen her look so happy. And she shows me a picture. She showed me what she's painting, and she showed me a picture of her painting, and she just looks really happy. So she can't, it would be foolish for her to renounce that because that's what she loves doing, and it's part of her nature. And so when she does it, she's happy. So if you have something that you can do that's part of your nature and you need to do it, that would be foolish to renounce it because it would just make you crazy. Right? But some things we can engage in devotional service, we have to renounce, right? What do I do with my propensity to have a hundred girlfriends? <laughs> Marry one woman, that's all you can do. Oh, but I need 99 more. You can't, it's not allowed. So you have to, at that point you have to renounce. But you can have one and engage, engage that propensity with one. What can you do? You want to go back to Godhead, you're at this point where to get back to Godhead, you know, you have to redu reduce the fever. It's just a reality. And I think a lot of us don't realize that that's what we're trying to do. And sometimes it's really hard to give up certain things. But, you know, there's security gates in the spiritual world. You've got to empty your pockets, you know. So you can't have all this garbage with you when you're trying to go back there. They won't let you through. How fast you renounce it, that's for you to decide. But at some point, when you want to go back to the spiritual world, you, you can't go with a suitcase. You've got to go empty-handed. Right? So you may not be ready now, but the idea is gradually get ready. So when you're my age, you should be ready. No bags left. Ready to go, no bags. And now you may have bags, you're younger, naturally you'll have bags, but those bags should be used in a way that in the future you'll not be in, attached to those bags. You can use them, but you won't be attached. So when it's time to go back to Godhead and Krishna says, well, you can come, but you can't take your luggage, you go, okay, no problem. Whereas now, if you went to the gates and Krishna said, You can't take those bags, you're going, hmm, I'll come back later. <laughs> it's more like that. I don't know, I don't think I'm ready yet. Okay, so if you're not ready, utilize those things in a way that you'll become pure of them. That's the program. As hard as that may be, it's just, that's what we have to do. I wish I could say something else, but you didn't have to do it. That's called Christianity. But we're not Christians. We say, you have to do these things. Christians say, you know, just accept Jesus and you're cool. 
But we don't say that. Not entirely. Anymore. But we do say, renounce according to your level, at your own speed. But Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga, this is Lord Chaitanya's movement. It is a movement of renunciation. And, you know, Prabhupada was so insistent about getting up early. Just pounding it all the time. Get, you know, that's the austerity. Get up early, chant your rounds, take bath, marvel arti. That austerity. You know. Prabhupada was not pounding so much austerity on us, but that austerity. And then go out and preach. That he was pounding all the time. You realize? Well, this is a great story. You want to hear a great story? It's a story about, this is a story about brahmacharis with hair. But Prabhupada wanted the brahmacharis, not like rihastas or people living outside, ordinary people, but people living inside the temple, and especially initiated bodies, but everyone living in the temple. He wanted the men to shave every two weeks. That was the program. You know, every, every other Sunday, you know, we would shave up and iron our dhotis and get ready for the Sunday feast. And for some reason, I don't know why, but some devotees suggested to one brahmachari to grow his hair out, so he had grown it out maybe a month or so. And Prabhupada saw that. He, was like, he said, why do you have hair? And he said, oh Prabhupada, they're saying it's better I have hair to grow. I better I grow my hair for this purpose. Prabhupada said, we are known as shaven-headed. We've been very successful shaven-headed. But Prabhupada revealed his concern. And he said, you're all hippies. And he said, these are the hippie seeds. The hair. Growing the hair, these are the hippie seeds. That's what he saw in the Brahmacharya. Oh, you're growing your hair? Means you're hippie, seed, hippie seeds. So, you know, who would think, you know, a little hair is any big problem? But Prabhupada was very concerned about devotees and their sense gratification. And so he interpreted in a brahmacharya growing hair, that meant sense gratification. And he was just like, why aren't you, sh go shave your head. So he's concerned about sense gratification, beyond what's necessary. Does that sound fanatic? Maybe. He was just concerned about sense gratification because he know he he knew it could destroy you, and it's addictive. Right? Sense gratification is like chocolate, addictive. Yes. So that's why we try to control it. So we won't be controlled by sense gratification. But, you know, and so remember, from time to least, understanding your psychology, you do something, it gives you pleasure, and therefore it creates attachment, because you remember the pleasure, right? Like, I, I love to play guitar. Um, I grew up by the beach, surfing, and you have probably had the things that you love to do, whatever it is, basketball, or I don't know what you do, that you love to do. And obviously I can't really engage those things that well in devotional service. But as a young devotee, I only had positive memories of those things. It was just pleasure, mostly pleasure. So there was a strong attachment. I'd always think about surfing. Maybe someday I'll go, there's an opportunity. And then I'm in the garden with Prabhupada, and he said, oh yes, these surfers, they're all going to become fish in their next life. <laughs> Oh yeah, Krishna, you arranged for me to hear that. And I just like, wow. That was really good. So and I'm, I'm sure you probably had similar experiences, right? Like there's something that you're dealing with and you just hear a lecture and it's like that an atomic bomb in your heart. It was just someone just exploded that attachment. So that gradually that's what we're trying to do. So you can see those things that brought you pleasure are the things you're most attached to. Right? So now Prabhupada says, oh, you'll become a fish. So that kind of ruins the whole party. Now, right? so you know what I mean? It's like, 
It doesn't look fun to surf anymore because I've become a fish. So that's how the guru purifies it. You know, Prabhupada said some interesting things about sex to like deflate the romance around it and the, the, the so-called high level of pleasure. He said things, he's like, and it shakes us up. So he's kind of, you know, Prabhupada says things to sober us about what we think is enjoyable. Have you heard those things? And some devotees say, sometimes Prabhupada was so heavy. And I said, yeah, he had to be because he was like, you know, chopping down a mountain of anarthas. You know, he couldn't just like come with a little hammer and you know, come with a, a thunderbolt. So sometimes his lectures were like thunderbolt. <laughs> Uh, you're sitting in the audience, you know, the whole room is shaking, and you think, wow, oh, Prabhupada's so heavy, and then you realize, unless he said that, I would never give up that attachment. I needed to hear something that heavy, because I'm so attached, and it's so bad for me. So we appreciated that. So we, we didn't think it was so heavy, we just thought it was good. It was like, it was what we needed. I mean, we knew we needed it. And sometimes Prabhupada would talk about materialistic people, and we knew he was, you know, it was us he was talking about. You know, it seems like he was talking about them, but we could relate to it. The foolish materialistic people, and he's just describing us. And he knows he's describing us, but it's the easier way to, right? It's easier to talk to us by telling us what other, how stupid other people are. And we're just as stupid. But we needed, you know, Sometimes you need to hear, if you're making a mistake, you, you need to hear in very strong words. Okay? Isn't it? So that's what he did. Yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't to me directly, but um, it was very purifying. So, um, I was friends with one of Prabhupada's servants, and so Prabhupada, he, he would read letters to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada would tell him what to say. And then he would write the letter, and then Prabhupada would look at the letter, and Prabhupada would sign it. That was the process. So I had asked to take sannyas, I was, I think, 24. And he, and he told me what Prabhupada said. So he said, he opened, many men were asking Prabhupada for sannyas. So he, he opened the letter and said, Prabhupada, another sannyas letter. Who is it from? Mahatma Das. Tell him he's a nonsense. Because <laughs> that, yeah, that was very sobering. And that was like, okay. Prabhupada is telling me I'm a nonsense. And then the letter said, yeah, just become ideal Grihastha, then we'll talk about sannyas later. Because you want to take sannyas. You're not even responsible. So how can we talk about sannyas? You have to first take care of your family. So like that, it was sobering. You know? Nonsense. You're a nonsense. That's good. I was thinking I was a great renunciate and world preacher, ready to you know, take sannyas and save the world, and my guru says, you're a nonsense. Does that put me in my place? So that sobered me. Um, one time, Prabhupada was, was talking a lot. I don't know if you know this, but Srub Damodar, in the early 70s, was a student in California, about 60 miles from Los Angeles. And so those life from life morning walks were all centered around him, specifically for him. And he was still a student at that time. He wasn't living in the temple. <coughs> but he would come up when Prabhupada was there in the morning walks. And so they'd have all these discussions, and then they were recorded and made into a book, transcribed, Life Comes From Life. And I was in Los Angeles at that time. Nobody like, had heard Prabhupada speak about science and evolution before. This is the first time we heard about it. And every day he's talking about it. And he's really heavy. We didn't know why. 
And then it one, you know, because he's talking about it a lot of times, because I was on some morning walks and I would see that Prabhupada would talk in Bhagavatam class about what he talked on the morning walks, because it was on his mind. So one morning in Bhagavatam class, Prabhupada dropped a bomb and he said, the scientists are the greatest enemies of human civilization. And so some devotees were analyzing this. Say, why is Prabhupada so heavy? And he was heavy on the morning walks. He was calling them rascals. It's Prabhupada, they say this. Then I kick in their face with boot. I mean, and what did Prabhupada mean? What they're saying is so nonsensical, they don't deserve an argument. They just deserve to be, you know, like, silenced. And like, we never heard Prabhupada speak like this. I said, why is he speaking like this? What's going on? And then we realized that these were all things we learned which were totally against the principles of Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada could see it was deeply grained in our belief system. And so he's every morning smashing. And then he comes to class and says, the greatest enemies, the great, you know, you think the scientists are the greatest enemies of human civilization? You, you might think Donald Trump is, but the <laughs> scientists, you know, it's like, no, they're saving human civilization. Medicines, we cure this disease, and airplanes, and, you know, Prabhupada acknowledged all of those things, but he meant the atheists. He said, they're, they're, they're destroying God consciousness. It's just, he says it, and the whole room shakes, and, and so then we start thinking in ways we hadn't thought before about our own beliefs and our own our own acceptance of evolution and, and how perhaps atheistic we are unknowingly or, or maybe we've got Maya body tendencies unknowingly. So those those kinds of things were were very powerful. And at least for me and I, I probably for all of us when Prabhupada was heavy, we understood that was the medicine we needed. And that's why he was heavy. And personally, I appreciate it. That, that, uh, sometimes we needed, we just needed a big hammer on the head. Because no, sometimes nothing was getting through. And then sometimes, Prabhupada would get very angry because nothing was getting through and the only way he would get through is he'd have to get angry. And then after it got through, he wasn't angry anymore. So he was teaching us, by, you know, this is important. When someone's angry, you, you realize, oh, that must be important, right? One of the things that I noticed Prabhupada did, or at least for me, he would take something that we were attached to, and he would minimize it, like, this is nothing. This is insignificant. You know, it's just like, it's like our whole attachment was just deflate like a balloon with a hole in it. <laughs> I mean, that's how I felt. You know, you're battling with this attachment, you know, you're a 20-year-old man, what's the attachment? You know, it's the attachment to the opposite sex. And your body is, you know, you're a young man, so it's, it's full of whatever it's full of that makes you look at every woman like not mother, but something other than mother, much different than mother. And then Prabhupada talks about sex, and he just like, he reduces it to like nothing, like, yeah, even insects do it. What's the big thing? You know? And that was very purifying for us, the way he would just take some big attachment and just, oh, it's nothing. It's just a little, you know, it's, it's just an itch. <coughs> Prabhupada, we're going out every day on Sankirtan, and, and, and we're going into parking, we're going to stores, and during the day, it's all women, or 90% women, the men are working. How do we deal with it? Oh, it's just an itch, tolerated. You know, like. <laughs> so, you know, the thing that has kept us in the material world forever, since day one, if God is in the material world, it's keeping us here. We don't know how to get, we don't know how to deal with it, and Prophet says, don't worry, it's just an itch, just tolerate it. So those things would help us tremendously, put things in perspective. Say, so wait a minute, you're, you're saving the world. 
And all that is is an itch. So don't let an itch stop you from saving the world. Go out there and sacrifice distribute books. I'm like, okay. And it would just, you know, then all of a sudden we could do it. Because Prabhupada was, when he said it, that's how he felt. And because he felt that way, that's how we felt. You know, this was like, I can't give this up. I don't know what I'm going to do, you know. How am I going to go on another day? And the prophet said, oh, it's just an itch, insects do it. And all of a sudden, it's not a problem anymore. So that heaviness is sometimes necessary. So if you ever think Prabhupada was heavy, just understand why. He was blowing up mountains, and you can't do it with a hammer. Mountains of contamination within the hearts of his disciples. And he's depending on these disciples to spread his movement, and he wants to make sure they're not going to fall off the cliff of sense gratification. He wants to keep them on the path of austerity and service, because they're the ones who are going to make the world Krishna conscious. So he sometimes is very heavy with this. Does that make sense? Yes? Make sense? I was just telling the devotees, I said, I said, I said, if, I went to South Africa in 1981, and they were in big mind because they had these little mats. I don't know if they still have them. These little mats, and they fold up. They're like perforated, and you can fold them in three, and then you can travel with them. And then when you go somewhere, you can lay the mat down. It's about this thick. And I was like, oh my God. The brahmacharis are sleeping on mats. They're in complete maya. Because I'd never slept on a mat before. <laughs> I only slept on the floor. I thought this was like, this was like insane maya. Was sleeping on a mat. So it's just how we lived. It was just you know it was a, it was a climate. It was a culture in Iskand. And I didn't even think I accepted the mat. I just thought it was too much maya. And I don't think I, I don't think I actually slept on a bed until I got married in 1993. You know, I think it was the first time I slept on a bed, and feeling very guilty doing it. <laughs> and if you in those days, if you went to a Grihasta's house. And you went in the bedroom, there wasn't anything in there. Because they just rolled out two sleeping bags at night. That's what was all was there, so there was nothing in there. So it was a much different movement. But you know, Prabhupada was preaching austerity, spreading the movement, and, and we were young, and that's how we interpreted everything. And that's how we lived, and we were very happy. And I'm not saying you have to live that way or sleeping on a bed is bad. I'm just trying to kind of give you a glimpse of what it was like. And, and, you know, if we were austere, Prabhupada was happy. I was telling the devotees today that the first time I was in Mayapur, check this out for us. It's 1975. So you know on the boundary wall there's all these shops, right? Well, at that time, those were, they had all kinds of looms here, and they were making cloth here, and that's where all those families lived, and I guess they must have moved some out. And so we lived in little rooms that I would say were maybe eight feet by six feet, do you think in feet? I'm about six feet tall, so it was about that, as wide as I am, and about this much longer than I am. But the ceiling was this high. You couldn't stand up. I don't know why. Maybe all the Bengalis were short. We couldn't even stand up in it. And our toilet was a hole in the ground. Out, um, there's a kund in the area of Prabhupada Samadhi. You know, sometimes they do festivals there. Well, when I came, it was just the kund. It was just mud and the kund. There was no cement or anything. And near there, they had dug a hole in the ground and they built a little structure around the hole, and that was the toilet. And your bathroom was the corner. So at four in the morning we get up, and there's a little hole, and you do 
whatever you have to do, <laughs> and then you brush your teeth wherever you brush them, I can't remember, and then you go at four in the morning in the dark down the mud path to the Kun and take a bath and go back in that little room and bang your head on the ceiling and try to get dressed and then go in the temple. And nobody complained about it. Isn't that interesting? Now, imagine that's where you live. That was the guest. Okay, here's your guest house. Here's your room. There's the Kun. There's the whole the room. <laughs> So you can see it was a different movement. <laughs> and so, you know, Prabhupada's thunderbolt preaching may have had something to do with that. <laughs> that okay, you know, we're preachers and, you know, it's not about sense gratification. So, you know, obviously we have a big movement to spread and not everyone lives in the temple and not everybody can live that way and most of the people who lived that way in 1975 couldn't live that way now. But still, I just, I don't want to make you feel bad and I don't want to make you think you have to live that way. I just want to help you realize that that was the culture, that we could live like that. And nobody, I promise, the only thing we complained about was the prasada. It was too hot to eat. And I think they cooked it in motor oil. And everybody got sick. But that's the only thing we complained about. Nobody complained about anything else. Do you all feel guilty now? <laughs> and nobody thought, oh, I'm not going to come back to Mayapur because of those little rooms or the, the kun we have to make. Nobody thought like that at all. And of course it got better, but that's that's just what we had. We accepted it. Ooh, class is over. Six thirty. Unless someone has some dying dying to ask something. So we can meet tomorrow. I don't know if we're meeting in this room tomorrow. It's one floor down. One floor down. I think this room is used by someone else. So we'll see you tomorrow, 5 30. We'll continue and then uh, five. we. Five, yeah, five, excuse me, five. We had, we had a question last week, and the question was how do you know, for you personally, what level of austerity is suitable or not? So maybe we can talk about that tomorrow, kind of evaluating what is healthy for you as an individual. Okay? Is that all right? Thank you very much. Sri the Prabhupada Ki Oh, Prabhupada Oh, yeah, we have books and CDs if you're interested.